on this episode of Edge of the Web. To me, if you read through this, what they're trying to do is have humans grade the algorithm. So to me, this is a window into the soul of the algorithm. It's just a manual check of that. So I really read through it, trying to read through it with kind of your mind's eye thing. What are they trying to do? What are they trying to evaluate? Because anything that they're trying to have these 10,000 plus humans do, you know that's what they're trying to do with their technology and with their artificial intelligence. Your weekly digital marketing trends with industry trend setting guests. You're listening and watching Edge of the Web. Winners of Best Podcast from the Content Marketing Institute for 2017. Hear and see more at edgeofthewebradio.com. Now, alongside Tom Broadbeck, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. And I am actually alongside Tom Broadbeck today. This is amazing. My name is Aaron Sparks, uh, CEO of Site Strategics. Welcome to this show. And to my left, you actually have Tom Broadbeck, who is the Director of Digital hey. Media. Good to who, be back. On. Who'd have thunk that you'd be back here? I know, I'm back. I think, you, I think it's the first time at the desk, actually. First time at this desk, yes. yes. Yep. New desk. New desk. Yep. Got little things here. You can pop up and. Ooh, you're fancy. literally going to play with toys while we're broadcasting. That's what toys are for, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> got our new mic stand holders. Yep. Yep. We're, we're, we're back. We're nasty. You got a new TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about that. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, uh, the reason we do the show on a regular basis, uh, literally weekly for the last six years, Tom. Six years. Six years. Oh, what, episode 260. This is 57. 57. 257. Oh, my well, It gosh. seems like just yesterday you got pulled over on the way home from one of our episodes. <laughs> you remember that? Yes, I do. Your son was just asleep. <laughs> Out cold. Yep. And we were on 65 for like an hour, and yep. they were going to tow your car. Yep, yep, sure do remember that. Thanks for bringing that one up. That was a good time. <laughs> well, the reason we do this show regularly is, is uh, one, it, we were wanting to make sure that we can break, uh, break out uh, and demystify uh, digital marketing tactics. There are so many uh, uh, different concepts out there, and over the years, things have changed, obviously, but, but more importantly, there's always things that are trending newest and hottest information that, that we're wanting to disseminate to our audiences worldwide. And thank you so much for all, all, the, uh, all the downloads and all the, uh, the interactivity over the years because it's been fantastic. But we also do this uh, a bit self-serving to make sure we keep our, our powder dry and that we are learning constantly in this uh, ever-moving space of digital marketing. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us online on Facebook. And we certainly appreciate all our audio uh, listeners on iTunes and all the all their respective areas. Um, I've got the digital uh, the director of digital media right next to me. But we also have somebody on the line. We have Phil Singleton, owner of the Kansas City Web Design. How are you doing, sir? Bill. So psyched to be here. I mean, really excited. And um, you guys have had some awesome guests. So I'm kind of, uh, I'm not worthy, but I'm also really excited. Uh, that actually sounded like Dana Carvey, too. <laughs> it really did. It it's, really it's did. like the who's who, man. You, you look at your uh, who you guys have interviewed over the years. Uh, it's the who's who of digital and SEO. So, dude, that's awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Hope I can bring it. Well, I mean, I mean, honestly, we, we haven't crashed yet. So, Phil, it's, it's, it's all up to you, man. Well, you unmuted me, so that's a start. <laughs> <laughs> no, it gives us thumbs up for the producers area. Well, uh, <laughs> Phil, you want to jump into some digital marketing news? Let's do it, man. All right. So let's jump in and find out what's trending on today's world stage of marketing. I was very excited to start my reportings. This week's trending topics. Okay, from Search Engine Land, uh, from Greg Sterling, a great uh, uh, resource out there. There's a study. 11 voice search ranking factors have been analyzed. Tom, what are we talking about here? So Backlinko did a study. Uh, Brian Dean and I forget his partner. Um, the other guy. The other guy. It was in <laughs> this, this article. It's a little further down. <clears throat> but they they did t they studied 10,000 results. I guess they did it one by one. I'm not sure how you do it in bulk. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, 10,000 results of, uh, of, of, of voice search results. And yep. so there's 11 uh, key factors that they wanted to highlight. Uh, I'll pull up his study here, not the Search Engine Land article. One, page speed appears to play a major, pole, major, major role in voice search. Mm -hmm. uh, having your website secure on an HTTPS 
Seventy uh, percent of all Google Home results were on HTTPS websites. No way, really. Uh, Google prefers huh. short, concise answers. Typical voice search was only twenty-nine words in length. Uh, he said schema may not play a key role in voice search rankings. Uh, authoritative domains tend to produce voice search results significantly more than non-authoritative domains. Mm -hmm. um, content with high levels of social engagement tend to perform well in voice search. Uh, the average voice search result has 1,199 Facebook shares and 44 tweets. Wow. Um, easy to read content may help with voice search. The average Google search result is written at a ninth grade level, which is good for Noah. Uh, we found uh, very few search... <laughs> Found the very few voice search results had the, ex the exact query in their title tag, so that your title tag doesn't matter as much. Uh, the average word count of a voice search result page is 2,312 words. Wow. Which I thought was interesting. Uh, content that ranks highly in desktop search is also very likely to, uh, is also very likely to appear as a voice search answer. Uh, and then appearing in a featured snippet may help you rank in voice search. 40% of all voice search answers came from a featured snippet. So this is a very lengthy study. He links to the Backlinko article um, in his, and Greg Sterling links it to the Backlinko article. But if you find out, go to backlinko.com. The full study is there, and it's a very lengthy article. So lots of good, lot of, lots of good information in there to peruse through. Absolutely, so. absolutely, and we'll make sure that we uh, let our know, let our audience know that's on Facebook that you can certainly ask questions up as as we're having our broadcast today, because that's how we roll. But Phil, what do you think about voice search? I think uh, what's well, really interesting, first of all, second of all, you asked somebody three, four, maybe five weeks ago, um, I think a lot of us, including myself, would have probably said, hey, we, we have a feeling that, um, you know, structured data and schema is going to play a role in this. Um, I still think it's early. Some of these studies seem like they might be a little bit early because so few websites that we run across are actually implementing, you know, structured data and schema on their sites mm -hmm. um, that I think it might be a little bit early to say that's not, or it might not maybe manifest itself in the studies. Um, because the whole purpose of it really is to add context, you know, to Google um, behind what's actually posted there so that they can, you know, extract more meaning and things like this to essentially hopefully be able to pull that stuff in, uh, into search through search results and, you know, more rich types of content like voice search. So to me, I think it's a little early to look at that and say there's no um, relationship between mm -hmm. voice and structured data because so few websites, I think, have actually deployed it out there yet. Yeah, uh, but we'll see. It's really interesting to start looking at it. But I guess my my um, my input on the, that is that it just seems a little bit early for some of these studies. But I'm glad people are doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to see some more standardization and some of the outliers kind of push away. But what was amazing is the the, the count, the word count, on average, over two thousand words. Yeah, that's striking, and that's and that that you know you start thinking about it, that's bookmarkable content. That's that's some good deep content that people put a lot of time invest a lot of time in outside of schema i think you're right schema has a direct connection with with voice search but on top of it um i, I think we're kind of converging in i mean we've got the knowledge yes. panel and we've got the rich snippets out there we've got shareable content we've got these really deep articles that are are valuable and then voice search is going to go that same direction it's just going to need a little bit of helping hand because it, it does need some some uh, handrails to actually understand more about that content from a search uh, from a voice relative uh, relativism right. standpoint, right and some of that i can't remember if it's that article or another one i was reading how and i think you just yeah tom went through some of this as well mm -hmm. um how the voice uh result is different a lot of times from the the featured snippet that rich is coming up and to me that's presents a little bit of a problem in that the you know the blind guy sees one thing and the deaf guy sees something else that that just doesn't work long term i yep. think there's got to be some way where you see that calibrate a little bit more. And that's the one interesting thing I think that we've seen, I don't think we've seen in the last, you know, if you've been doing this for five or 10 or 15 years, um, the way that they roll stuff out into the wild now is just, you see stuff in like moving all the time. So I think this stuff is, is um, one of the examples that's really kind of in flux and it's like you're seeing the things that, that work stick and other things, you know, roll yep. off. Um, yep. And this is one of those areas we're probably gonna see a lot of it. No, no, you're absolutely right. So uh, our next article actually goes even deeper into the, just this very topic from Michelle Robbins over at Search Engine Land. Multifaceted featured snippets began rolling out in the Google search. Uh, check this out. Is that Google has actually been rolling out many new search features over the past few months in, related to images, featured snippets, and knowledge graph. Today, the search giant released another 
feature that's called multifaceted snippets. Like we haven't had enough to actually pay attention to. Right. All right. Multifaceted feature snippets will will be surfaced for queries that are sufficiently broad enough to allow for more than one interpretation of what was submitted. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, we talked about this with uh, I forget who, but it was a couple. It was a couple episodes ago. Bing, right. there's Noah's got the uh, the screenshot there of the Bing mm-hmm. example. We were talking about tutus or something, if I remember correctly. But um, <laughs> that's what that's what the image was. We were oh talking no about no tutus. no! It was hot yoga. Hot yoga. There you go. Yes, <laughs> hot yoga. Close. <laughs> tutus and hot. You do hot yoga and tutus. I think. I uh, evidently so. Yeah. You don't do it in kilts. <laughs> no. Just saying. That's not the tactical kinds. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so. This is Google's, I guess, not reaction, but uh, mm-hmm. further development as, as they're seeing how people are using the voice search. So there could be more than one answer for the question, yep. depending on what the, the, I guess, the intention of the asker. Exactly. So in these instances, the SERP, SERP will actually return uh, more than one featured snippet with the original query rewritten as the questions the algorithm assumes the, mayor, the, the, the user may have it actually intended. And the results displayed in the multifaceted snippet will reflect those new questions. So, you know, I think this is also a a, a way to tr- uh, that Google's trying to train the environment and yes. and understand more of intent as opposed to the query itself because it's trying to connect those mm-hmm. logic jumps, right? Yeah, exactly. When I see that, I'm looking, it's almost like they're trying, you know, we see the traditional organic results where you can go through 10 and scan on a page. Well, I have my intent. I'm trusting that they're bringing up 10 results. I can scan quickly and pick the one I think that I want to pick. Mm-hmm. But it's now it's almost like they're trying to make that decision for you. But if they choose wrong, because mm-hmm. they can't decide which one is, they almost kind of have to give you those two options, I guess, there, if, if they detect that there's a difference in intent, because the, the queries, you know, could be interpreted two different ways. Um, but it's really interesting. So I look at that and it's like almost like to me there they get, you know, you got the organic results down there, but it's like they went and tried to guess at the best two, depending on that term. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of my interpretation of it. Although, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not Moz or even Brian Dean who has the budget to dig into this with, with large studies type of deal. Um, but I am a user and I'm on Google all the time and that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Yeah, uh, you, for for all of our listeners, if you haven't dug into rich snippets and and start putting that inside of your code, um, yes. you you don't understand how far you are removed from where the battleground is. And and for any agency, they've got to make sure their snippets are in place. They're, they they they're paying attention to the type of content they're pushing out there. It's a it's an on ramp for Google that that they've extended out for the last two years, three years. And it's getting ever more present, especially in voice search, and especially in these knowledge panels that are that are popping up. You're, you're getting more. Google's giving you more utilization of their real estate to get into search result zero. You just have to deploy it. Amen. And so few people are deploying it. To me, it's like wide open. I mean, yeah. you see some websites that come to you guys or whoever. I mean, first of all. A lot of people don't put enough, at least when you get into small, medium-sized businesses, aren't putting enough into their digital and, and website altogether. Right. You know, the ones that are even paying attention to it, if, if they're just doing the basics of on-page SEO, I think you're pretty pretty lucky. But then you take it to the next level where you're actually um, you know, marking up the pages properly. I think it's wide open. I mean, we've got all sorts of anecdotal examples of our own clients. We're just applying you know, the structured data and the schema language to the page. Um, assuming that you're doing all these other things mm-hmm. uh, to, to help your organic, that you it, it, you know you can. It's not that hard right now um, to, for for you know lower qual uh, less competitive keywords to actually get a chance you know into the knowledge boxes into the into the rich yeah, and, and, and um, just by doing it yeah, just by doing it. <laughs> and there's a huge local play there, and that that can clearly differentiate your site as opposed to another site. And uh, you know you don't have to go national. I mean, if you're trying to outdo your local competitor in whatever industry you are, man. That's that's one of the key things that you should be deploying. All right. Anyway, here's an article that I didn't expect to come across my desk, but my gosh, I'm sad, Tom. I know. It makes me sad. And you never got the mustache. I never got the mustache. And that makes me sadder. <laughs> so from Rand Fishkin over at Spark Toro. Not Moz. Yesterday, he pushed out an article. 17 years ago, he dropped out of college to work with his mom, Jillian, on the business that became Moz. For seven years, 2007 to 2014, he was the company's CEO for the last four years. He's been in a variety of different contributor roles, and yesterday, he left Moz. Wow. 
Yeah. That's huge. It is big news. And I was just reading a lot of a lot of stuff on Twitter about how you know how he's made such a big obviously he's made a big impact on the industry, but that's right. Uh, that's it's kind of big news. It is big. I, I mean he led a community. He 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 honestly I, I want to I want to be careful here because there's a huge amount of of influencers that we've interviewed and and some some great great people in the industry uh, that have their own communities. But man, Moz is and was and is a huge community mm-hmm. of of great thinkers that that contribute and help standardize the entire environment of search engine optimization. Right. Yeah. And he was he was a, he, he has been the figurehead and he's he's led the charge. And uh, I mean, all those whiteboard Fridays. I mean, that was just fantastic. Yep. So, what's he going to be doing? Uh, the Spark Toro is his, his new company. Mm-hmm. Um, Spark Toro is in a different field. Here's from his article. It says Spark Toro, Spark Toro is in a different field of marketing, influencer, and audience intelligence. He says, "I'm hoping we can solve the thorny, painful problem of discovering where a given audience spends time, who and what they listen to, and where they engage." Some folks call this influencer marketing. But uh, he's found the terminology to be too limiting. It's, off, it's often exclusively associated with paying Instagram and YouTube celebrities to post about a product. And that's not where this mm. product slash company is going. And the next year, he hopes to have a product. So, Very And cool. he's got a book coming out in he's April. A book, Lost and, uh, Lost and Founder, Painful, Honest, Field Guide mm. to the Startup World, which we'd, we'd love to have him on, uh, on the show to talk yeah. about. And on top of he's starting a nonprofit project to help make conferences and events safer. That's yeah. pretty cool. I, I, I gotta say, I'm kind of sad here, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in this industry that that hate to see this. But I mean, he's an entrepreneur. You know, he's gonna move to that next next degree. Phil, sorry to wax poetically here. What, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, it's just one of those moments where I haven't really felt like you don't feel it reverberate through the industry. Like, um, I mean, the last time I really felt this way, although it's different, is when you know Matt Cutts was mm-hmm. leaving, and you felt that going mm-hmm. away. And I was like, wow, what? That's gonna be really different. Um, and, and ran for sure because he's kind of was the – it's really weird to have a guy that is at the forefront of personal branding authority and influence that actually brought the company to where it is. And this is a topic that's like hotter than ever right now. That person, that figurehead's leaving, you know, while this is like the hottest it's ever been. So it's really just a really strange moment to have the guy that's like been synonymous with, with SEO education, you know, leaving the company that he found type of a thing. Although I will say, I mean, it also seems like it's trending a little bit. You've got um, super another super successful guy um, in Larry Kim at WordStream. Yep. Mm-hmm. He left to start uh, Mobile Monkey last year because, you know, he ran that thing and it's great and successful and he did it and he's going to do it again. You know, another technology. Sure. So maybe that's just something we're going to see. And Danny um, Sullivan a, left. Uh, that's right. SEO. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. what, really what is our world coming to, man? Know. What's happening? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he did. He did say that uh, the White Boy Fridays. Are, he, he's got a, a slew of them that he's already filmed, and they're going to be. Uh, he's going to be working with one internal team uh, on a big project project release. That uh, so he's he, he's not finished with Moz, but um, you know. It, it, it is sad to be able to see see what has transpired. And Ma certainly had to pull back and 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 refocus his efforts mm-hmm. a, efforts in getting uh, um, uh, yeah. kind of realigned with what they're trying to do. But yeah. uh, he has yeah. such a huge following that you always yeah. want. I mean, what do you think? What happens? With, does that affect Ma's at all? Yeah, I mean, they've no. got a great community. They've got great products. But still, it's one of those things where. Um, that, that's kind of curious. Yeah, maybe I'm. Maybe I'm. <laughs> yeah, we had we had, we had Rand on. Right when they kind of scaled back and they're kind of refocusing the company, and you right. could tell he was upset. Yeah, he, like was. he, he wasn't. He wasn't happy. And no, it was a somber moment, yeah. and he he was really reflective. Yeah. And then I asked him for and then, his mustache. Yes. Yeah. So if it, <laughs> listeners haven't listened to the episode, Aaron asked him. Aaron well, he asked, said, "Whenever they become profitable, he's going to shave off his mustache." And before I could control myself, I asked him, "Could he mail it to me?" Well, who asks that? This is the weird, he, it was the most awkward situation, and I was sitting right next to him, and it was very awkward. And I'm sure he probably hates us for it. I wouldn't doubt that. But yeah, no, anyway. no, 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 no. You know, I, I, the one thing that really changed my whole opinion of Rand, I already held him in with high regard, is he wrote this long, super vulnerable. It was long, it was but it was an art. You know, he wrote that post about. His bout of de- with depression, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it was so real. And as he, I, I mean, I, I could probably quote parts of it where I could, you know, all the great content he's come up with over the years. I can't quote 
you know, stuff from a particular post that was so great. But I remember that one because it was his journey. It was real. It was kind of like one of these things where he made himself vulnerable and a real person. Yeah. Um, and it totally took that thing to the, to the next level for me, for him. And, um, and I, he made you tell that was just, that wasn't like a little thing. I'm depressed. He was like really in he a was different real, state yeah. of mind. It yeah. was like physical, you know what I mean? It wasn't like I'm sad type of thing. And yeah. he dealt with it and he shared it. And I think a lot of other people out there, you know, have, and I think that was, um, that's his baby, man. It's almost like, you know, changing know. or losing a, a family member. Yeah. No, it's tough to swallow, but you know what? You know he's going to land on his feet, and you know he's got a great new new focus on things. So we're certainly going to want to bring him back on the show with Spark Toro and, and find out what he's doing there. Um, but kudos to to Rand. Uh, and, oh my and, god, and guy's we, gonna come, he's going to come up with so many. He's got more ideas in his head, you know, <laughs> to make money than. Yeah, I know it. I know it. You know, you know, he's going to do well. Uh, and you can also do well by subscribing to that. our newsletter on that. a regular basis. If you just jump in, <laughs> was that gratuitous? That was gratuitous, was it not? No, it was good. <laughs> if you text to the number 22828, the word Edge Talk, you can sign out right from your from your smartphone. But you can also go over to edgeofthewebradio.com, submit right there, and uh, just jump into our newsletter. Uh, we use use uh, your email for nothing but sending you some great email newsletters on a, on a weekly basis talking about who we just talked about. So you're going to learn about, uh, hopefully, uh, what we're going to have a great conversation with Phil. We just don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> But but you're also going to find out some great news and great great items here. <laughs> First half of interview fail. <laughs> I'm just I, I wanted to read ahead of my newsletter, but I just don't know what we're going to be talking about yet. Anyway, uh, all this all this information, much more on the edge of the web newsletter. So uh, sign up, and uh, we certainly appreciate all our subscribers, and uh, keep on keep on giving us feedback because we want to know what you want to hear from the show. All right, enough with the plug there. You feature, find out all the featuring trend, featured trending topics over at edgeofthewebradio.com. So let's deep dive with this week's featured guest. Now it's time for Edge of the Web featured interview with Phil Singleton. How about that? That was a deep voice guy, man. That's epic, man. <laughs> <laughs> We really do have to send this out to to all of our guests as a ringtone. <laughs> I'm not sure what your contract is with, oh, with, no, with, with not, Paul. Never, never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden, I'm extending licenses across the country. <laughs> hey, Phil Singleton. For our audience, Phil Singleton is a web designer, SEO expert, and award-winning author. In two, in, since 2005, he's owned and operated a digital agency in Kansas City. In 2016, Phil co-wrote the book, SEO for Growth, The Ultimate Guide for Marketers, Web Designers, and Entrepreneurs, and is an Amazon bestseller. Uh Kudos for the book, man, and kudos for sticking with agencies as long as you have, because man, it's a it's a tough gig, is it not? Sure is. Sure well, is. feast or fan. I mean, it's you know, I've, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it in your city, and I see it in mine all the time. Um, you're not set up right. You don't have. You haven't moved over to some kind of recurring model, feast or famine. You mm -hmm. see agencies fall on their ass like every year. Yep. Decent sized ones that have been around. It happens all the time in my town, anyway. Yep, yep, yep. Um, but it's tough, yeah. And, and a lot of times they don't really pay attention to the most important thing. <laughs> and they can get to themselves sideways and, and who they are and what they are as a cult, from a culture standpoint. Uh, you're, you're doing work for the clients. you got to win for the clients over and over again, right? Exactly. And you can't um, – you just got to – you can't hire – you can't go – Feast or famine, get a big project, hire a bunch of people, bust out on great office space, and right. then think that the work's going to come unless you've got, unless you're doing really well what you're selling your clients, basically. And that, that's what, you know, that's the proof. That's right. That's right. Well, Phil, why don't you tell us your backstory and how you first came to jump into SEO? Well, I am took an unconventional path. I'm basically a digital or at least a computer science near flunky i got a d in computer science in college oh dude um rolled out of school was lucky to have a job when i did come out of school but um i went into the exciting world of insurance um and i was there for about three or four years and just completely miserable um and hmm. i figured i had to really make a change because there's a bunch of corporate zombies i was going to a, you know an office with beige pants beige walls beige uh carpet and I just phil, had to phil, get out of phil, there. phil your your wall behind you is beige <laughs> I added some blue, and, is, <laughs> and the difference is the difference is it's my office. That's there right, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so beige is beautiful now. <laughs> it's my but beige, damn it. Then, 
I, I had to get out of insurance and do something totally different and change my whole life. So I ended up packing up my bags, long story short, moved to Asia. I lived in Taiwan wow. about 10 years. Yeah. I learned, I learned Mandarin Chinese. Um, it was a wild ride, you know, going through there, but it was the last couple of years I was there where I was really introduced. And this is going back again, like more than 10 years ago, almost 15 years ago. Hmm. Um, I had this software company fall into my lap. This is over 15 years ago. And, um, it was then when I was introduced to like website and really affiliate marketing and this kind of stuff. And I was like, cause I, again, I was, I'm an industry outsider. I came from finance, you know, business and a software company that fallen into my lap, uh, kind of in my mid early thirties. And I uh, was introduced to, you know, selling software online, affiliate marketing, all this kind of stuff. And I was like, Holy cow, here's this company that I'm, that I'm running here. That was basically, I just kind of fell into my lap and, and we're writing checks. What I couldn't figure out in the beginning is we're writing checks to these guys out in there. Uh, in the world um, for 50, 70, 80, hundred thousand dollars a month. And all they really had was an affiliate banner back, you know, on their site, pointing back to our website. We were selling this com computer software. For me, that was really maddening because I was like, well, we get 50% of the sale from, you know, these larger affiliates. And here I've got investors, software support. You know, our little piece of that was um, whittled down to almost nothing where these hmm. guys were running these forums, the precursors, the blogs, all this kind of stuff. We're, um, we're getting the lion's share of the money for very little of the work. So again, at that time, boom, opened my eyes up, follow the ROI trail directly to Google because that was even driving sales back then. Yep. People were looking for this software online. And I was like, okay, I get it. Um, ended up selling that company, um, moving back to the States. I ended up building my first website in 2005, um, really just on a barter type of a thing. Moved back here to Kansas City to kind of basically start a family because we've been in Asia for so long. Um, I did the, I did my first website, didn't have any development, any design experience. Uh, I did know a little bit of SEO because again, I just really opened my eyes um, in that last piece uh, of my career there in, in Taiwan. And I did one website for this guy, um, it was an auto detailer, one page. I tried it in Dreamweaver, failed, ended up doing it in Microsoft front page. If you remember what that is. Ah. <laughs> the, uh, an ugly one page purple and yellow auto detailing website. Um, but six, you know, two months later, the guy started his phone started ringing. Of course, it was 2005, really easy. And then calls me up, near tears in his eyes. I could hear his voice cracking. Phil, I don't know what you've done. You've changed my business, changed my life. I, I repeat this story quite a bit because that's when I really felt. I was 35 years old, and I really felt that that's when I grew up. And I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up type of thing. Oh, wow. But also, it was the most rewarding thing that ever happened to me. And I was like, holy crap, I can actually make some money off of this. So... 2005, first website on Barter. That's kind of rolled into what I've done today and developing. I have my own little agency, and you know we've done hundreds of websites, have scores of SEO clients, and now I'm, you know, I, I was, at, I loved the business of SEO and digital marketing pre Panda and Penguin because you know we could move the needle with things without ever having to even talk to people. Of course, that Google came and kind of chased a lot of us out of our holes. I'm one of the, now, I'm on, now I'm on podcasts. I'm writing books. I'm doing all sorts of things, putting myself out there because that's that's the way it is today. But that's my backstory, man. So let's not align podcasts with some of those dark <laughs> channels of of SEO tech. <laughs> Podcasting is literally and, and video cast. I mean, we really appreciate you being on board here because this is where we can actually unpack and understand um, the history of, of individuals and why they're in the spaces that, that you're in. And what you just keyed in was something that's very, very important is, is that you, you, it was the most gratifying thing to be able to see that you were able to, to affect somebody's business, right? And it was right there, and, and it was your work. And that's from SEOs. I mean, I, I don't think they, they really sing that loud enough. Is We get into our, into our te technical SEO jargon, but we really don't shout, to the, shout the, the fact that we do affect a heck of a lot of growth for businesses, right? Yes. And to me, if you're going to do this long enough, and you know, I've been doing it for 15 years, if you've been doing it for 10, 5, 10, 15 years, whatever it is, you've gotten your ass kicked a few times. Amen. And, <laughs> and some people just say, I've had enough. I don't want to have to deal with it. So it has to be more. Right. Um, you have to be, I think a lot of teams, you'll see people that are competitive, but there has to be that piece for me where it's like, I actually love dealing with small businesses. And because they, you know, you get started with people and you guys see this all the time yourselves. Once you get in there, there's a little bit of things where you have to get in there and kind of prove yourself. But once you prove yourself, you're not just a vendor anymore. You're one of their partners. That's right. And that's just really gratifying. I mean, that that that's and it has to be like that because it's, you know, we have to stay on top of stuff and, and work our butt off sometime. And if it's not, if there's not something more than money, mm -hmm. I don't think you have a lot you know, people have a long career in it because it'll it'll really beat you up. No, um, no, you're right. If, if you're just trying to do that. So 
You're absolutely right, and 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 that, it's a lesson to learn to for all SEOs, all digital marketers, is that it's not just the execution. You're just not marketing. You're affecting somebody's business, and you you've got to you you've got to connect with them in that space, and and you've got to be real with them. And and sometimes you screw up. Yeah, I mean this is it's marketing experimentation. That's it goes hand in hand, hand in hand. But my gosh. Uh, whenever you get it right and you start building that new revenue for them, it's 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 monumental and it's so important to the client. You're part of their team. They yeah. trust you. They start asking for other ideas, and it's just a totally different um, relationship. And I think you know, if you do it right, I don't say it, but the way I like to do it is I think you get eventually they start looking at you like they would almost an attorney for advice or mm. their CPA that they've been working with for deals. And now you're kind of the digital marketing guy. And however you get in there, through its web design yep. or your, your SEO, eventually you're, the whole thing, kind of, they all kind of wrap together right now. So, um, but that's, yeah, it's it's the relationships, man, and working with companies and and, ha- and who wants to, and, and on the flip side of that, mm. I mean, sometimes I've had clients that actually pay pretty good money, but they're so, it's demeaning. Mm. And I don't care how much they're paying me. Um, they're looking at me as a vendor and not as a partner. It's just not fun anymore. And you get a point in your life when you're working, you, you don't have to maybe eat as much glass and you're looking for more of the, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? You're looking for more of those things where you're, you want to work. And, and, and if you're doing SEO or anything, internet marketing, I think you have to, in order for that client to have a piece of your, in, in your brain where you're, they're constantly on their mind, hmm. um, it has to be a good working relationship. You're just not going to think about them as much, you know, and, and then that, and you're not going to, I think, work as hard. At least that's how I am. Maybe that's my human nature coming into this. No, but. you're absolutely right. I, I don't think in the years that we've been doing this, I don't think that's ever been expressed on this show. Is that that the relation? It's, you know, I love the analogy of, of eating glass because that's absolutely the case. <laughs> um, but the the fact that it's also part of the the responsibility of the client that they have to open up and be a partner with you because we're all human here. And as much as we're disciplined and getting the job done, right, there's this care factor. And if you as a client uh, just see us as a vendor, right, I mean, this is this is human nature is that you're not in that space. You are not taking care of you nearly as much as, in, in, exactly. all, in all honesty, the other uh, other clients that that have that relationship with you. That's 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 a student total man. reality. I mean, wow. do you say that to people? But that's the way we all are. I mean, <laughs> that's what we you, talk about we, on the show. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's why I love it. It's like, but um, you know that you work harder and you want people to win that you like and clients you get along with, and the ones that are are just there. It's like, how long is this paycheck gonna last? It's just not even fair wow. to them at that point. You know what I mean? So, uh, I don't. Maybe I'm that. When you get to the point in your career, maybe where I am, I don't want to. I want to be happy and work for people that make me happy and I make happy. Yep. Um. I'm not, you're in a position, you get to a position at some point where you can, I don't want to say cherry pick, but I mean, you, you want, you want to pick ideal clients because the ones that aren't and the ones don't see the value, it's just, it's not going to be sustainable probably anyway. Yep. Um, because that's the one thing I think with SEO and digital in general, you can, you guys have seen this, I'm sure myself, I've, I've dealt with this a couple of times over the years, once or twice, at least a year, um, where you'll do a great job for folks and you kind of bring them up, but they get used to like really good work and it's like incrementally, you know, well, you're keeping them up and they're getting the traffic, but you can't keep that, <clears throat> that, that line going, you know, as you could in the beginning and all of a sudden great's not good enough anymore. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and they just kind of lose the value in that piece. So I think again, communication, having that relationship, them understanding what you're doing and, um, and, and not seeing it as a vendor is, is key to long-term relationships. No, no, you're absolutely right. As well as sending them pies, <laughs> pies and cookies, pies and cookies. Yeah. Do that. Take care of them. Right. I I haven't gotten a pie. What about your employees? Oh man, peanut butter pie. <laughs> no one's got a pie. I've wow. never gotten a pie. I've gotten a couple cookies. I would, I, if I was a customer, mm-hmm. I would love a pie. Yes, that's a good. That's a good idea. Do yeah, you guys send swag out and stuff to your clients and things like that, or? Well, evidently we're going to now. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta find a we gotta find a pie company. Yeah, we gotta work with a pie company and figure out some sort of barter so we can get it out to the rest of the uh, there you go, rest of the clients. So if there's a pie company that needs some SEO work, some digital marketing, you need to contact us. All right, Phil, this is your show. Hey, um, cool little things here, little coasters. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. okay. I like coasters too. Coasters. We got we've got uh, squishy rocket ships. Sweet. Yeah, we can put an eye out. All right, so. Speaking of uh, putting an eye out, there is a huge document that's out uh, for Google search evaluators. Okay, so for, for our client, for our listeners who don't know, 
the inner workings of Google is that, yeah, there's a heck of a lot of uh, AI, there's a heck of a lot of rank brain, there's a heck of a lot of machine ranking and evaluation, but there is another factor out there, and that is the, the, the human element, and there's an entire tribe of Googlers that are evaluating your website. And there's a document out there that Google, I think the first time they review, revealed that was two years ago, two, two and a half, something like that. I don't know. Their latest one was July 27th. Is there, oh, wow. Okay. It's 2017. Is their newest version? So, yeah, it was over. Yeah, that that was ago. the second version that they yeah. rolled out there. Um, so uh, there are there's an entire group of Google search quality evaluators, and there's a guideline uh, for that. And uh, it's 160 pages of how to evaluate sites online from the human side of things. So first off, can you explain, Phil, the, the, the Google search quality evaluator guidelines and who these people are? <laughs> well, it's, it's as you're saying, Aaron, and they've got, I think it's an army of at least 10,000. I want to say 15,000, but I mean, it's a lot of people that they have actually, and they're regular people. It's not like they went and hired, um, you know, rocket scientists or engineers from top colleges and stuff to, to do a manual check on the algorithms. It's just regular people that they pay 10 to 15 bucks an hour. I think I read somewhere, um, but there's an army of them to manually check, uh, you know, the search quality uh, to basically test, you know, the algorithm, a manual check of it. Hmm. Um, but what really struck me and the reason I really poured myself and studied it a lot um, earlier in the year is really oddly enough, because of the last election cycle. Um, I feel like a lot of people, businesses in general, inherently don't trust the internet or they did before the last elections. And I think now in the era of fake news and all this other stuff that's coming out there and interference and people are putting the false information up or claims of it, um, it's become even less trustworthy, mm -hmm. right? So what I saw that happened is I read the one that came out before the first one, I think in, in February, and then they, then they actually edited it again, whatever it was in the summer. Um, but it was really striking to me how they started mentioning things about um, it, it just it just really got a lot more, I think, into trust um, and education and trying to evaluate which kind of sites are real and which aren't. And I thought it was um, just it just really motivated me to act because for the first time I thought, geez, you know what, if I really if I read through this document, because they're really trying to give people a step by step guide in terms of you know, how to go and actually evaluate a page and they get pretty granular. Right. I mean, they go in there and they say, what's the purpose of a of a page? How much is enough main content? What's hmm. the is there enough? What's supplementary content? Where are ads? and Where should they be on a page? Um, and then they really start to hammer some uh, some um, acronyms, I guess is the right word. Right. EAT mm -hmm. um, in there. They over and over again. I'd like to do kind of do a word search on that PDF to see how many times it's mentioned. But EAT expertise, authoritative, authoritativeness and trustworthiness. Yep. Um, those are words you see in, in that, that acronym over, over and over again in there. So once I read that over myself, I was like, it, it just really dawned on me, even in terms of my own website, because our whole philosophy and the way we do business here um, in my market is I basically, I'm my own guinea pig. So the systems that we put in place, I want to make sure they're working for myself. And I use that for proof. So oh, one good. of the things I did is I read through the document and I was like, geez, you know, I really have to change my website and redesign it according to what my interpretation, I think of what um, I think Google's trying to do with this, with this new document. I mm -hmm. just thought it was really um, eye opening. So what I've done, I think a lot of people have already done this anyway, maybe in terms of inbound marketing and digital in general is to go through and start adding elements of education, authoritativeness and trust on your website versus the old school way of maybe just outlining and explaining and adding copy about what your product and services are in your own history. So that's because that's to me, if you read through this, what they're trying to do is have humans grade the algorithm. So to me, this is a window into the soul of the algorithm. It's just a manual check of that. So I really read through it, trying to read through it with kind of your mind's eye thing. What are they trying to do? What are they trying to evaluate? Because anything that they're trying to have these 10,000 plus humans do, you know, that's what they're trying to do with their technology and with their artificial intelligence, right? So right. we can really zero. So I don't, and if Google puts out a document like this on their server, you know, they've poured over every word of it probably many times over. So I don't take any of it for granted. Oh, heck yeah. You know what I mean? So when they say you must know who was the author of this web page, I take that seriously. I put my face on it. I put my bio information. I make sure that my phone number's um, accessible. I make sure that my address is available on every page. And I want to make sure that they, I put the things that they're saying on the website, like um, make sure that people can see citations of your work on other authoritative websites. They see your picture. Maybe they've got testimonials on there. Lay out all the evidence page by page on your own website because that's what they're asking these 
um, search quality evaluator uh, guy to do. And I, so I, I'm basically taking it pretty literally. Yep. Um, and we're applying this to our own websites and our client websites. And I think I think that's kind of I think it's one of the most important documents in SEO in general. Of course, I don't have the <laughs> the weight to say that like like a Rand Fishkin or somebody else does. But you know, I've made these changes, and we've seen traffic and conversion rates go up as uh, um, anecdotally mm -hmm. um, with our own with our own book as uh, as a result of it. Well, I think I mean it, it goes back to the the the, the base foundation is that uh, Google's telling you what it's looking for, and if you want to play in their sandbox, you, you best pay attention. And when they and when they reveal when they revealed the this 160 page tome. Uh, the first time, I mean, it was a shock mm -hmm. because this is the first time that they ever, I mean, they had evaluators for years gone by. This was the first time they publicly published it, published it mm -hmm. for all of us to consume. And that was a big deal mm -hmm. because we were looking at this going, wow, all right, y'all <laughs> best get, on, get toes on the line because if they're saying it, if they're publicizing it, and, and this is the entire manner of webmasters uh, uh, forums for, for Google is that they would poke out just a little bit of information. It was never a full-on, hey, this is everything that you need to do because they're going to hide this stuff. But if they're actually rolling out an entire quality researcher's guide, evaluator's guide, then they're telling you to pay attention because this is, this is, the, lear totally. this is the learning tool for their AI. Exactly. Yep. And they've got humans that are paying you. I just love, I'm actually pulled it up and you guys probably are too. If you're looking at the first page that outlines like the table of contents, I mean, mm -hmm. definitions, what's the purpose of the page, identifying main content, identifying supplementary content, identifying advertisements, summary of parts page. And then it goes into finding the homepage, who is responsible. It, then it specifically says finding about us. Now, yeah. if that isn't a direct, you know, mm. you must yeah. have an about us page that is rich with your history. What else? It's them saying you have to have it basically. You know yep. what I mean? Yeah. So a lot of people don't do that anymore. Yeah. Do we need an about us or it's too yeah. thin? I mean, they're actually telling these 10,000 sure. people that they're paying to make sure yeah. that it's on there and apply that to the score because yeah. they want their algorithm to be doing the same yeah. thing. So and there are certain things in here that are just like no brainers. Reputation research. Customer reviews. I mean, there's just this outlining out. So to me, it's like, here's that. the recipe for rankings, <laughs> yeah. man. This is what you should be focusing on. <laughs> yeah. There it is. I was going to say about the About Us page. I, if everybody goes and looks into Google Analytics account, I guarantee you their About Us page is probably their third or fourth most traffic to website. Because that's yep. what people do. They, if they were, they're researching your company, they're going to go to your homepage. Next click is going to be their About Us. And I hate it when people put it in a sub menu. Yep. Yeah. Like, get that in the top level ma nav. Yep. Don't hide that in your because that's what people are looking for. They're going to go to your homepage. They're going to click on the page, and they're going to go to the about us to learn more about you. It's it's, it's a qualifying. It's and it's a relationship play, and that's what people do. It's that yeah. it's no, it's not just services. People won't be persuaded to actually buy from you because of the sir how well your service page. They're going to find out who's behind this company, yep. right? Yep. No, no. I, I love this piece too. Now that, what, there's a whole section here: website reputation. I mean, geez, if that's not if you don't have, I mean. Website reputation, reputation research, sources of reputation information, customer reviews of stores. And I mean, they're saying, they're yeah. telling you, they're screaming at you, get, go work on your review strategy, you know, mm -hmm. how to search for reputation information, what to do when you find no information. I mean, that whole section. That, so if, if you're in a business and you're not focusing on your reputation strategy and being proactive about it, yep. I mean, if that's not, and they've got a, a huge section dedicated to this, obviously, if, if they're telling you in this document, they're paying people to look for it. You know that the algorithms are out there searching for it. You have to do it. I think um, it's got to be a huge factor. And I think you boil this thing down, man. To me, it's like the it's the recipe. <laughs> it's yeah. the recipe for web design and a big part of you know SEO digital. Yeah, to be honest with you, is that if you're if we're talking if if any any um, uh, organizations that hire agencies are listening to the show, I mean, there's a huge uh, a litmus test right there. If if the agency that you're working with is not familiar with the Google search quality uh, evaluation guidelines, right? Ask, what? what is that? Just right. ask them that. Just ask them, and, and do they actually execute from those guidelines? Boy, you, can, you can separate the wheat from the chaff right there, right? Red flag, red flag. <laughs> <laughs> Run away, danger, Will Robinson. Well, is there a common mistake that you see most websites make whenever uh, you're rolling out uh, uh, sites that adhere to these guidelines? I mean, I think just in general, and you guys are going to see this is a little bit talk and chop, but I mean, we, you know, for us, 90% of my business comes from our either referrals or from our own inbound, you know, local SEO stuff and um, see the same thing over and over again, yep. which is um, most people, even to this day, I mean, 
most people treat their websites as digital brochures. And I think still almost everybody out there, relatively speaking, um, views a website as a sunk cost and as a cost of business and not as an investment or a marketing platform. So that's, I mean, I, we're on a show here. We've got, I think, a lot of sophisticated people that look at it, but I still mm-hmm. think a lot of people mm-hmm. think of their website as a static thing that's basically a stepchild of their marketing it, it, thing. And they it was of, a project. And, and the, it's just sat and it's just there and it's not, yeah. they don't invest in it. They don't, it, it should be the referral source for all of their content and they should be publishing content. I mean, really, that's what we all should be doing right now, right? We're all trying to work on our personal branding, our influence as a business. We're trying to blog and create content and make sure that your website is the hub of all those activities. Well, a lot of it's disjointed, right? They're doing it in puzzle pieces. It really should be all directed back to your website. And I think that when you tie it all together, um, and this is part of the thing we wrote in, in, in SEO for growth is really tried to kind of break out. And I get a little bit of flack from actually hardcore SEO people that still think SEO is like on page and off page backlinks. Mm-hmm. To me, those are only slices of the pie, right? The whole thing's holistic. Now your website's kind of the foundation of, it. I think that's the big problem that a lot of hmm. companies make today is they don't see their business as a marketing platform. They see it as a digital brochure still. And for us as digital marketers, it's, it doesn't help to have the Wix, the Weeblies, the GoDaddies, the Squarespaces out there saying, beautiful websites, $50 a month, and we'll get you listed on Google. <laughs> and it's almost kind of like brainwashes people to think, well, that website should only be you know a few hundred dollars type of a thing versus right. the basically the manifestation of an entire holistic digital marketing plan, right? But that's how, kind of hard to get out in a commercial <laughs> and you can't, uh, and, and it costs a bit more. Just a little bit, um, but you know what? I think the, the best... The best thing working for us is the uh, uh, the self leveling playing field is that they too will learn that that uh, I mean the marketplace corrects itself and whenever people you know, businesses are hiring for that Squarespace that Squarespace website and it's not doing anything for them and they will come come over to our side, <laughs> uh, you know, soon thereafter. It, it, there's always this, this acclimation process. And, and more, more often than not, we're seeing so many, so many businesses that did, did work with those type of things. They're, they're finally coming, coming home. So, to so speak. You're, you're seeing more people come around yeah. or you guys yeah. still see it too. Now you're on the local business leader. So I'm, I'm interviewing you. No, I'm, just, <laughs> uh, but I'm just curious in, in your guys shop. I mean, you must come to that a little bit. Yeah. I, of course, we're a little bit in the smaller, larger, small businesses and just guys that have come in. Obviously the ones that have been in a little bit more mm-hmm. there, they've got some issues with maybe feeling burned or not getting the ROI, but they're a little bit more educated right? because um, they had to be. Uh, but there's still a lot of people out there that are still, you know, especially when you get into older generation businesses, yeah, yeah, they're yeah, still absolutely. dipping their toes in digital. You know what I mean? And because yeah, they, yeah. they've done it that way, they've gotten burned because there's no way to do the thing piecemeal. But um, you must see that all the time, too. We're, I mean, we're, no. we're, we're seeing that. We're also seeing on the enterprise level, we're seeing a lot of fractionalized digital uh, marketing uh, vendors that are being pulled into organizations. So no longer is it, uh, you know, uh, put, putting your eggs in one basket, all your eggs in one basket with a digital firm. Uh, they're starting the, the, the enterprise level are, are getting more and more savvy. Let's go find those very specific um, services that people are that they, the vendors very very skilled at. You know, so you're, you're hiring specialists now, and everybody has to play nice and get along. The, exactly. The only thing that I think is really cool, and I'm seeing again, kind of at the local smaller business level, is you get a lot of um, people that I think are still snarking at millennials in general. Um, but I've seen something that's really cool happen here over the last like 12, 18 months is some of the millennial business owners that are stepping into traditional businesses that don't know anything else. They don't know the old school Hmm. way of doing outbound stuff. So they jump right into, they understand the value of a website. They know they got to be in social media ad. They're just, they're just there. There's no yep. convincing. They're just like, that's all. That's just the way they were raised in the first place. So, they're native. They yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Keep on. They come in and kick ass. I mean, they kick ass out of the gate because they're willing to invest in a website. They start doing SEO. They start doing AdWords. They start you know, creating content, getting involved in social media. And all of a sudden, they look like, because they're working on their reputation, the 40-year company's got two reviews locally. And the, the millennial guy or the younger business owner's got 100 who looks like they've been doing in business 40 years now. There it is. It's the young. So that, I mean, they're just coming up and stealing 
literally stealing market share. It's almost like the <laughs> Uberization or Airbnb, you know, type mm -hmm. thing that's happening where people that got, you know, the younger the technologies got in the in the old um, traditional there and basically turned it on its head. I see that happen a lot at the local level now, just because the digital natives are coming up and just stealing. Stealing, literally. It's not like the market's growing that much. It could be, but they're just taking the business away from the guys that have had it for years because they're too slow. I uh, literally see a meme in my head. There's going to be some sort of, uh, of uh, 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 sketch animation for the digital marketer stealing the old dog's business. I love that. Exactly. That's a great, that's a great vision. Happening. It's it happening. is happening. We should send it to Tom Fishburne. We will. We will. We, we need to have him uh, do, a, do, a, do a custom <laughs> uh, custom comic for us. Hey, um, let's talk about your, your book for a second, if we could. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> How dare you? Let's move on to something. Um, so, yeah, it was really interesting. I think it was a great um, influencer hack for me because mm -hmm. um, I essentially, you know, part of my a little bit of my backstory is the introverted SEO guy gets a little bit of his ass kicked in the, pan, in the panda, not so much in the panda, but uh, a couple iterations of, of Penguin. I did feel it on probably 15 or 20 percent of my sites, which was enough to... Um, scare the crap out of me. But hmm. I, you saw how things happen. I mean, the whole industry changed. Content, they said, was king. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Content became king and all this kind of stuff happened. Behavior changed. Now, all of a sudden, to me, I saw I've actually got to become a marketer now and not just zero in on this little piece that really moves the needle a lot because that totally changed. So what, the, what I did to try and force myself into a broader view of marketing is I started looking around for some of the gurus out there. So I think it's kind of funny because I think a lot of us in pure SEO early on snarked a little bit at the social media and the content people and all of a sudden they're like they, yeah, own the we did, they inherited did. the earth now yeah. um, but I looked around and I was like who's got something that, that can I can actually learn from and I ended up settling with um, duct tape marketing John Jantz who's oh, kind cool. of a small business marketing so I ended up reading his book I realized he was in town here I ended up joining his um, his marketing network and I think that really did open me up to the inbound marketing piece and help me pull all those kind of the pieces together. Well, I joined the group. There weren't a lot of SEO folks in there at the time and I kind of became the go-to person for a lot of SEO stuff and I ended up, part of the reason I joined is in the back of my head is like, I'd like to be able to leverage John to some, because he's one handshake away from everybody. You mentioned anybody out there, he's basically known or podcasted with and all that kind of stuff. And, and I figured if I get in his good graces, prove myself, do some things, help educate, give, 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 give. I'd have a chance maybe to work on some projects. So um, I did that. I do, when I jumped into the, to the duct tape marketing group, which is like a mastermind thing, which is really cool when you start joining some of these influencer groups. And I think other people can do what I did for the people that offer this. In John's case, he's got like all the courses and things you can take, but he actually has a networking group mm -hmm. that you can join and it's very personal. So you get a lot of shoulder and you know hand, FaceTime with him. Um, and with other people. And that's key because if you can start to really build a relationship like I did with an influencer like him and take advantage of it, um, like I did, um, it really, I think, made a difference. So the, that's kind of the, how the book was born. I went in, I was invited on a book project with another group of duct tape marketers. I did one or two of those, really opened my eyes up to be like, holy cow, it's really, really easy to write a book. Because <laughs> I went into the first meeting that I went into, one of the other guys, duct tape marketing guys, handed the book that he had just written. I was like, God, that's a that would be a career milestone or a nice career bucket list thing to have. Mm -hmm. um, but six months later, I had my first bestseller, the uh, Small Business Owner's Guide to Local Lead Generation. I was like, holy cow, totally opened my mind up. Really easy to publish a book on Amazon, really easy to get endorsements from people and use that as a way to get access um, to other influencers because they're surprisingly easy to get endorsements from people because you're basically reaffirming their authority. Um, but I did that and I did another book project after that. And then I said, you know what, I'm going to write my own book and I'm gonna, I've got, and I'm going to try and see if I can get John involved somehow. I didn't tell him this ahead of time. I went ahead and wrote the original draft of the manuscript. Then I approached him when I had something completely done. And I said, Hey, John, I've got this idea. There's two parts of it. Would you um, one, write the forward of it and help me market it a little bit like you did the other books or two, we could go in as co-authors and maybe use this as a platform to do some more better things nationally um, in SEO in terms of courses or maybe some kind of licensing and turn some businesses out of it. Well, he totally went for it. Of course, I had known him for three years. Again, I had really proven myself and he trusted me. He trusted my knowledge and trusted the fact that I'd kind of gave back to the network type of thing. Cool. And that was really has been a life changing thing for me because we got his involvement. He came on as a co-author, you know, we kind of basically rewrote it. He put his spin on it, but he really got behind it. He brought other people in on it. We got um, over 50 endorsements from top-level people, um, which I think is an, 
if you go about writing a book, obviously writing the book, any kind of a book to me is you're not trying to make money off the book. And it's not about the book itself. Right. The coolest thing about writing it was all the people we, I basically applied a lot of SEO tactics to the actual off, you know, the print version of it, which was getting as many people to endorse it as possible mm -hmm. because it's shiny book bling, but you can also, <laughs> you can also lean on those people as we did when we launched the book to they'll promote it for you. A lot of them will. Hey, my book. So that's 50. Then at the end of each book, if you read the, if you read it, there's 16 chapters at the end of each chapter, we basically um, pointed out a recommended expert to watch. And that's where we went for guys like Rand Fishkin, Larry Kim, um, you know, a bunch of other uh, top Eric. Guys. Yeah. Yeah. Jay bear. Eric Anga, Jay bear, you know, these guys. Um, and we made them part of the book, which I thought was a really interesting way to go about any kind of a book. Cause we wrote them up a one page you know, we said, hey, here's, this is the top guy related to this chapter. But when we wrote those little one-page bios, we actually sent them to every single one of those 16 experts. And every single one of them edited it and basically became part of the book. That that's, was a phenomenal. That's a cool play. You see the you see what oh happened? yeah so, yeah yeah I get it completely. All of a sudden they're bought in and they're gonna move boom. they're gonna move mountains on on just visibility for themselves because you pulled them in inside the paddock. And they actually wrote a little bit of it. They wrote their part. Eric Anga, Mark Trapping, all these guys that are in there. Every single one of them um, who probably wouldn't have answered an email from me, they would have answered one from John. But because I said I was part of this, so you see where my path was is the, uh -huh. the guy that's in Kansas City with a little boutique shop went in there, leveraged another influencer. Now I've got all these people saying nice things about me through him and the content that I did. And I basically used those. And the other thing that we did that really worked out well was I purposely cited the hell out of it. So there's actually every almost every page of the books got a citation to somebody else's blog post or research. Hmm. Well, when the book went out, every single one of those people, we contacted and said, we use you to prove our case because your content was so good. Oh, so see, sudden, there's another was, play right there. Boom. So, yeah, <laughs> but that's, that's an SEO guy, I yep. think, think, because yep. most people don't, they think of endorsement just as a one dimensional, oh, it'll look good on the book. Well, no, you can take it a step further and ask these people if they'll, and a lot of them did, man. Larry Kim went out and really, really helped us out with an email blast, I think, and um, shared on social media networks. He gave that's us right. an ebook. Um, used to Voc gave us an ebook that we bundled with it. So it was just, I think it was, if you use it as a collaboration, like that was my favorite thing about the book is how we executed it mm -hmm. and how we built a website. And, you know, we had a whole guest blogging thing campaign on it. And really this, what we're doing right now is still kind of an after effect of being able to use it to get access on high quality shows like yours, right? Because I've got more credibility now because I went through that process and brought all those people in. And Very when you cool. land on the SEO for growth site website, yeah. I mean, we've got like, it's like, it's like a who's who in as of itself. It's like, who are these guys? It's all of a sudden all these people say nice things about it. It's like immediate, you know, credibility. For Absolutely. Us, so. And it, it's very well done. And, and what we're, what we're experiencing as we're talking about it, this is it's not, it's, it's, a, it's not just a PR of a book launch. It's right. it's the it's the convergence of an SEO technician realizing that there's a heck of a lot of additional playing factors, and that's what an SEO does, right? Yes. Yeah, is that they, you understand the different points of value, and you're bringing everything around to a delivery. But each and every one of those points of value help the entire thing move. It's not just one lane or a couple different PR lanes, right? It is literally the digital tethers that you're creating around the promotion of this book well played sir well played i dig it appreciate that <laughs> well thank you thank you for getting it because it's so funny when people sometimes you explain it and it just it doesn't man it's connected all the dots really quickly and it's 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 lo it's lovely to see somebody that um sees all the parts yeah. and, and why we did it that way yeah, i mean so i kind of see kind of see a similar story of what we do with with our show yep you know it's got all the same thing nice. I, I gotta write a book I, I, I'm now inspired by Phil. I got to write a book now. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see how that, <laughs> book, how that book you know, goes. You know what? One of the thing, one of the reasons I did my you ever, squirrel, you know, Josh, squirrel. You know, you know Josh Steinley? Yeah. He, um, well, he wrote this book, um, "Chief Marketing Officers at Work," which is essentially like 15 or 20 interviews that he yep. just compiled into. A, I mean, yep. that's one of the reasons why I started my podcast. Like, guys, if I really got thoughtful about this and asked the right questions. They could just transcribe it, pile together another book. In that's like that's a my point. <laughs> we have the book here. We've been doing it for six years. Sure. See? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah that's got what, that's what, that's there, what Tim Ferriss did. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. He's like three books or two books uh, 
ti- tools for titans and tribe of mentors. Those are just interviews from his podcast. So awesome. Yep. Well, hey, uh, regarding the book, uh, uh, great to be able to see the the methodology behind it. Do you have one actionable step that you could share from the book to our listeners? Look, my favorite thing that I've been doing, I think everybody can do this, no matter if you're just getting out of school, and probably a lot of people won't, but I hope they do, um, or do it for your own business or do it for your clients. Is, um, we talked a little bit in the green room before the show about how I've been really involved in podcast guesting. Mm-hmm. And the reason I do that now is my, my eyes opened up in that um, I think everybody that we work with and do stuff, which should really be working towards personal branding and what I would call like an authority or authority driven marketing campaign. And how we've been doing it is essentially comes back to the blogging and doing this multi-dimensional dimensional approach. So every every client that we work with, we got a blog. I think blogging, is, as you guys know, is the cornerstone, an inbound cornerstone, I think, of SEO, where you can grow it out organically and use it for social media, fodder, and all this kind of stuff. Well, we never do one one-off blog posts anymore. We're building series, hmm. blog series, that are either 10 or 15 posts, and we're doing them in its format of a table of contents. Each one standalone is a great blog post, stitched together is a nice ebook. Ebook comes back to the website, call to action, that kind of stuff. Then we spin it up into a Kindle. Kindle goes up on Amazon. Client gets a nice shiny Amazon came. We made them an author, right? Mm-hmm. Get Amazon. Then we'd make that author, we turn them and and then we we turn on a podcast guesting campaign. Now right. use that book as a way to get them into other shows. They all of a sudden are doing their own SEO and inbound and all the things we talked about, I think before the show, which is personal branding, audience access, um, organic backlinks, which are great, all that kind of stuff, right? All sorts of cross social media. So all that kind of stuff where, where to me, it's what's really interesting about that part. If you, if you work with a client for yourself, it's essential. if you just do one blog post a week and don't have this like strategy behind it, it's hard to stitch together and then take that path all the way down. Right. Um, but the interesting thing about the guesting campaign, and this is going to be for advanced content marketers, and but I think everybody can do it. We're doing it for several clients on, right now, is that they're kind of doing, as a marketer, they're kind of doing the homework for you. You get them booked on shows and yep. prep them. Yep. They go do the work. Now they got transcript. You know, the transcripts. They got a great blog post. They're, um the one thing I love about guesting too is you can either help fix reputation management issues or or kind of have a pre- uh, preemptive. Because you get all these shows and you somebody get a client that does maybe two shows a week over the course of a year or two, hmm. all of a sudden they're they've got these show notes that are about them with their name in the URLs that helps it can help push down old articles that they might that some might have had um, issues with type of thing or <laughs> prevent one prevent one later right so they're basically kind of stacking the deck and the serps in their name type of thing because that happens every once in a while so all sort that's that's the actionable thing is think about that and think about um, think about your blogging strategy investing in your website creating a series making yourself a book author because it's so easy if you do it this way um, and then think about guesting campaigns man it's the che- I've been doing this for me exclusively for 12 years I've never done any tactic that's given me as much bang for the buck as getting on somebody else's show that's amazing because I'm getting access to their audience. They're talking about me. I mean, some of these guys have shows like yourself have, have um, advertisers and sponsors. They get like 60 or 120 seconds. Right. I get the full 30 minutes or an hour and it's about me, man. You know what I mean? Type of thing. And they get to talk <laughs> on it. So, um, total, I mean, if, if you were to ask, if you were to go to a client, I did this for somebody else. If you say, here's all the benefits of podcast guesting. And you went to an influencer that had a podcast and said, I want, and didn't call it podcasting, but just showed them all the benefits and said, I want you to do all this stuff with me and put you in my email and put you in my social media and write a blog post about me. And how, and, and my, and then you said, how much is it going to cost me? They'd probably say thousands and thousands of dollars, right? You better believe it. But if you got on their podcast because you were smart about your blogging strategy and made yourself an author and differentiated yourself and positioned yourself as an expert in your niche, you can get on those shows for free. And get all that benefit and do it over and over again. It's the fastest way to me to authority and great backlinks and all that stuff that you can do, which is one of the reasons I'm so excited about it and been doing it myself. And for me, because I've been on like over 60 shows, I've gotten at least over 100 grand in new business, probably closer to 200 if I tally it all up this year. And of course, for me, that's a website and maybe mm-hmm. two to three thousand dollar retainer type thing. So, but that's not why I do. I mean, it's still great, but you can actually get revenues off of it, right? 
Yeah, but, actually, uh, in, in, in that particular vein, uh, I think you are actually mistaken, Phil. We will be charging you for this particular show. <laughs> I'll send awesome. you the bill. Especially, <laughs> especially, as we, uh, especially as we know we're contributing into your revenue gen. So, <laughs> no, per, I mean, perfect, man. That, that's exactly what this new media is all about. Right. Um, so so kudos to you on that. Hey, you're also working on certifications for SEOs. Yeah, that's the, that was kind of fate. It's the current phase of SEO for growth is to really turn the book into courses and then start to um, use that piece to help educate people based on the book. Yep. And then we've actually got a whole nother format. Where we're helping digital agencies that aren't so strong on maybe just marketers that don't have the inbound flow. Um, on SEO at their level, we basically created some sitelets, uh, actually microsites on subdomains for cities. Mm -hmm. We're working with 20 different agencies where we're helping those people too. But the first phase of that is really to get the courses and the certification up. My God, we need certifications out there. <laughs> exactly. That's, we that's do. the thing, right? But it's a moving target. That's a problem. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, you know, hey, uh, Phil, it's been a fantastic uh, journey uh, hearing about your strategy of your marketing and strategy of your work because when it gets down to it, if you if you're just ad hocking flopping around like a fish out there in, in the in the in the influencer uh, realm, it, it's never going to come come home for you. But if you're actually doing this, doing what you're doing with strategy at the at the key and and you and you look at the 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 omni channel way that you can affect um, brand and reputation. Um, that's the play, man. You're doing it right. Hey, a couple last questions here for you. What bugs you about your industry right now? Um, about our industry in general, I yeah. think it's still, I think, I think the fact that a, a lot of stuff is still sold in pieces drives me nuts. Um, it meaning in pieces of the puzzle, right? I mean, to, and this is just my vantage point. I think to win anymore, mm -hmm. it has to be holistic, but you still see people going out and hip shooting. Yep. And I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's the industry taking advantage of people that are just looking for the tactical band-aids or it's a condition of the actual buyers, but hmm. there's not enough education. I mean, it seems like we're in it. So we feel like, gosh, inbound marketing has been here for a few years now. It's beyond being a hot point, but I still think every, you know, people are like, my, I need more leads for my business. So let me find an SEO guy. Let me find a, a social media person. Let me, right. it's all kind of these pieces. But at the end of the day, somebody has got to be coordinating that all together to get, to get, like you were saying, to wrap it up, you get to get, you can't be thinking about things in one dimensional one X terms. I mean, we, as SEO people, we're natural hackers. I mean, we're trying to get shortcuts to stuff and get right things that are sustainable and, and things that are get um, more wins off of just the one effort. But I think that's what bothers me about the industry is that we kind of feed into that a little bit. Right. But, our whole strategy, I think, is and you guys probably do the same thing, is they come in for tactic, we sell them the strategy. Yep. Um, but I still think enough people are out there that just sell them the strategy. Mm -hmm. And it can't win. You, if you don't have the holistic thing, there's just no, you can't get enough out of it. There's no way. And, you know, it, you and it gives the industry a, a bloody eye. I mean, I, I, I call them bloody stumps sometimes as, as a company comes in, and they're also not communicating how bad they are in need of things. And they've WebMD'd themselves into, I need SEO. You exactly. got to get past that and say, okay, what are you really needing here? You need leads? Okay, well, let's get, take you over to the lead focus, <clears throat> not growing, <clears throat> not not growing our, an organic farm that's going to yield a yield a crop in eight to ten months. You know, if that, exactly. I'm all I'm all, all choked, choked up. up. <laughs> <laughs> really passionate about it. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, what excites you about your industry? <clears throat> I think um, I really like, and the flip side, I really like that it's. Um, I really like that we don't have to focus as SEO people in general, that we're not just tweaking stuff under the hood and trying to find the next loophole with backlinks or something like that. And it's become uh, more holistic because to me, it's, I mean, I feared that in the beginning because I had my SEO blinders on in the beginning. I was so focused on, a, on, on that piece of it. But yep. um, now I actually love it that I think to really win and to have those relationships that we struck at the beginning, that you need if you're a good digital marketer in general and i think the ones that have seo mindsets i would call it are probably going to be better at this than anybody else which is it puts us in a good position to be that digital marketing advisor versus maybe some of the other ones that are coming at different angles yep that's what excites me because when somebody comes in to us they come in for web design or whatever they're coming from they're coming for adwords they're coming for ad they're coming for seo we bring them back to the website and tell them to get those leads. You need to be doing all these pieces together in a synchronized way. And I think that's the only way forward. So that's really what excites me also is that 
I just don't think you're going to be able to win with one dimensional the tactics going down there. It's going to have to be more and more holistic because the way Google's reaching out and they're, they're just able to like see so many things right now. Hmm. If you're not doing that in a strategic sense where it's like the spoke and the hubs and tied together, you're not going to win, which is going to make it, I think, easier for those of us that get that piece of it to win for our clients. And I think that's exciting. No, no, I, I appreciate that. You're absolutely right. Hey, fun fact. Uh, you want to lay, uh, lay on us the fun fact uh, from your history there? I gave it up already, man. Yeah, Somebody that actually makes a good living that from, from I think, I got a D in computer science. Not many people know that. And I was afraid to say that in the beginning, but I'm just like, nah, I don't really care, man. I, one, guy that I talk, one, well, one guy that I talked to early on was like, no, man. He's like, I don't want to learn from somebody that's had, you know, how to lose weight from somebody that's had 3% body fat their whole life. I want somebody that's face planted and got back up and figured it out type of thing. Well, that's me. I was like, dude, this is, I was, you know, 35 years old. You're the creepy old guy at Facebook, right? And then what they call them one of those guys that works there now. He's got a lawsuit against them. I mean, I was, you know, Pat, I was, Pat, you know, these guys that are all learning it from school and stuff. I learned it kind of as a second career type thing. And, and, and I didn't come from a space where, you know, I hated computers type of deal. So that's, that's my fun fact. Very cool. Well, I mean, lesson learned is that, uh, I mean, it, it, this is all new territory and in the in, in digital marketing it's been around but it's still evolving and it's constantly evolving itself so i mean at no point in time can people uh, uh, oh, sorry, at any point in time i'm sorry people can jump on and learn and learn from great talent across the world i mean phil you're 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 killing it we certainly recommend uh picking up the book in fact we're going to pick up a copy of the book and bring it i'm going to send you a copy of it but you're going to find it remedial but um hopefully you'll see that you guys will appreciate the the seo behind the scenes you i know why he did that there's all yeah, sorts yeah, of yeah 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 and there's an seo glossary where we make you go back to the website to read it for all sorts of things that tie in back to the website <laughs> Uh, well, is there anything that we could actually promote for you uh, to kind of tie off our show here? Well, I got my own podcast, which um, I was late to the game on that. I should have started that before my guesting campaign, but they're never too late to start, like you said. Um, because it's been so beneficial for me, John and I started a book podcast guesting service called podcastbookers.com. Mm -hmm. That would be one. The book site, the official book site's uh, seoforgrowth.com. Um, and if you want to check out my kcwebdesigner.com that check out how I applied uh, the search quality guidelines and you'll see compare what I did on there and you can kind of see what the sites that I hit on there. It's also where my podcast is. So sweet. That's the little website that could though, just here in Kansas city. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're doing good work out there and kudos for you for uh, 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 face planting, but uh, moving into into greatness. Uh, so we really appreciate your time today. Um, we're certainly gonna gonna lift you up here on social. So for our li uh, for our listeners, you want to follow Phil, uh, follow him on his KC websites, Twitter. Uh, also uh, jump over to Facebook at website uh, web design Kansas City and LinkedIn SEO Kansas City. Um, anything else? Uh, can we follow you anywhere else? I'm most active on LinkedIn. I mean, you know, cool. we got companies, places that are on social, but that's just kind of where that's the one I picked and I'm really investing in this year and I have the most fun on. So excellent. LinkedIn, man. LinkedIn. Cool. It's a good place to, to kind of set up camp there. All right. Well, Phil, thank you so, so much for your time today. Tom, Aaron, really appreciate it. More than welcome. I hope you enjoy the stay here and uh, uh, everything went flawlessly. I, 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 I Kudos. Did I you. redeem myself? You did. <laughs> <laughs> We Thank had a betting you. pool beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, it was awesome and uh, really uh, inspiring. So I appreciate uh, all the hard work out there. Keep uh, Fight the good fight, man. Thanks, guys. Uh, absolutely, too. absolutely. Also, thank you for listening to Edge of the Web Radio. A special thank you to all our colleagues at Site Strategics for helping us produce this regularly. And if you're interested in the agile side of things and what Site Strategics does, just go over to sitestrategics.com. Find out about agile marketing and uh, even talk to us because we would be happy to kind of spell it out and see and show you what it means uh, from a from a from a, a quick move and result results based. Uh, marketing execution. So that's sitesrategics.com. Very special thank you to our guest, Phil Singleton. Be sure to check out all the must-see information and audio, all the shows over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. Uh, next week, who are we talking to, Tom? Jeremiah Smith from Simple Tiger. 
Very cool. Very, very cool. So you got to check that out. Jeremiah Smith is going to be on the edge next week. So for all of us at edge, thanks so much. Uh, be sure to review and, and like us on all the socials. We really appreciate uh, uh, that, that input. And uh, if you want to see something else and, li- and have us interview somebody, give us a, give us a jingle. We'll be able to get them on the show. Uh, all right. That's a, uh, that's a wrap. Thanks so much. This is edge of the web. Do not be a piece of cyber driftwood. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,